Hello, is this on? This is your favorite chemistry teacher coming to you from my home. Isn't that exciting? I recorded this entire thing and then I realized I didn't record the sound. So I'm a little punchy now. <laughs> anyway, the, hopefully this one will have sound. I wanted to talk to you today about the periodic table. We're officially in unit two. This is the beginning of our unit on electrons and periodic trends. And all that has to do with the periodic table. The periodic table is something that's very near and dear to my heart. Actually, it's near and dear to my butt because it's in my wallet. I have a copy of the periodic table that I carry around with me all the time. I love the periodic table so much that when I was in high school, there was a dance that I went to without a, without a, a date. And there's actually a picture of me, probably on the internet somewhere, of me holding my little copy of the periodic table and slow dancing with it. I'm that much of a nerd. Anyway, without further ado, let me get uh, going here with our PowerPoint. Please feel free to pause the PowerPoint um, at any, you know, as we go, because I'm going to go through just as if I'm talking. You're going to need to probably, um, you know, take some notes. Um, so pause it, and then also you should have access to a guided note sheet that you're welcome to use if you like. And there are some blank periodic tables that you can um, color on. So there's colored pencils there, um, and you can color on those uh, periodic tables because I'm going to show you some different um, parts that we have to be familiar with. All right, so here's the story of the periodic table. Our guiding question, the biggest question is, why on earth is the periodic table shaped like that? It's weird, right? Like, why not a rectangle or like an alphabetical list? You know, table S has an alphabetical list. Isn't that nice? Oh, wait, no, table S is arranged by atomic number, isn't it? Uh, anyway, why not make an alphabetical list? Wouldn't that make everybody's life more, you know, a little bit easier? Anyway, the other guiding question is, what other information can we get from the periodic table? And the answer to that is going to help us understand why the periodic table is shaped the way it's shaped. We can get a lot of information just by looking at where elements are on the periodic table. All right, our story starts with a crazy Russian dude, Dmitry Mendeleev. Um, there's a really great, um, there's a really great video that is like you know one of those crash course videos that I recommend. Um, a crash course on the periodic table. Um, if you Google it and you find the one, it, they uh, talk quite a bit about Dmitry Mendeleev's story. It's very cool. Um, a little bit crazy, but very cool. Anyway, back in like prehistoric times, right? Like all the way back before all the major civilizations, people knew about some of these elements, right? Like they knew about copper, they knew about lead, they knew about gold. Um, and so then, you know, when they started, when science got started, um, a lot of these elements were given Latin or Greek names. And then way far forward in the 1800s, once chemistry had been established as a true science um, and not, you know, a bunch of magical thinking, um, we started to, to discover a whole lot more elements because there was a systematic way of doing chemical reactions and understanding how to, to simplify compounds and, and separate out and purify their elements. So we discovered a bunch of elements and there were getting to be so many of them, people were saying, well, how should we organize them? What kind of a list should we make? What kind of a list makes the most sense? And so Mendeleev came along and he wasn't the only one. There was this guy named John Newlands and some other people who had this idea too. But he said, I know, why don't we make a list of all the elements based on their mass number? how heavy they are, right? And the most, you know, the least um, heavy elements, like the lightest elements, like hydrogen, would go first. And, uh, you know, as you go along, they would get heavier and heavier. And so he did that, and he noticed something special, something that these other scientists did not notice. And so he gets credit for developing the periodic table. He noticed a pattern. Chemists love patterns. The pattern was called the rule of octaves. Now, how many notes are in an octave? You would say eight, of course. Well, it turns out Mendeleev noticed that if you list the elements in order of their mass number, 
about every eight elements or so, they started to have similar properties. So he decided to make a chart and he made eight groups and he put all the elements in order and he noticed that like, oh man, look at this. If I line them up every eight elements, they start to have the same properties as each other. And then he did something even cooler than that. He was able to say, you know what? If we leave a space because, you know, this element doesn't quite fit here, it actually fits like in the next group over. If we leave a space right there, we could predict elements that haven't been discovered yet. So he predicted the existence and properties of at least three elements that are listed there, germanium, gallium, and scandium. So let me show you his table. There it is, or at least that's like a you know typed version of it. Um, you'll notice that group one, group two, group three, these are not written in English. And that's because the language of science has changed over time. It used to be that people only spoke Latin if they were educated, and therefore, you know, scientists being educated were like, well, let's speak Latin so that nobody else can understand us, right? But that was also useful because people from other countries who also spoke Latin could converse in it. So the language of science has changed from Latin, or from Greek, and then Latin until it was German for a while, French for a while, and now it's English. Um, and then someday it'll be Chinese. Um, and it all has to do with the number of scientists that are speaking that language. And so whatever the dominant language of science is, that's what all scientists learn and produce the work in that language. So at any rate, group one, group two, this is, I think, German. And so um, you'll notice that he starts out with hydrogen, right, which is pretty much where it is on our modern periodic table. And then if you look, there's no helium. Helium hadn't been discovered yet. And so he goes from hydrogen to lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine. Those look pretty similar to our current periodic table. And then you come back down and he goes through, you know, sodium, magnesium, aluminum, etc. Everything's great. But then you get down to the fourth row, potassium, calcium, and then blank. You'll notice there's some blanks here. And that's because he decided after calcium, the next element that was known was titanium. But rather than put it in group three, he said, you know what? It's not like boron and aluminum. Titanium is more like carbon and silicon in terms of its properties. Let's put it in group four. And that said, that meant that there was this blank space where there was no element in group three. And he said, well, you know, there should be an element there and it should have a mass of about 44 atomic mass units, right? So he predicted that and it turns out he was right. And so there is an element, its mass is about 44 and it has similar properties to to boron and aluminum. I'll bet you can't guess what it is. Take a look at your periodic table. So at any rate, he identified these spaces and by lining up the elements that have the same properties in the same columns, he was able to predict elements that hadn't been discovered yet. Pretty freaking awesome. Now, our story comes forward a little bit in time, 1913 or so. This guy named Henry Mosley, look at him, the handsome dude. Uh, was another student of Rutherford's, and he was using x-rays. Now, he could, you could shine x-rays on atoms, and certain frequencies of, of x-ray would, would um, interact with an atom's nucleus in a certain way. And so he was measuring that, and he noticed that if you line them up by atomic number, which is the number of protons, that's right, I knew you would get that. If you line them up by how many protons they have, it turns out that the pattern that Mendeleev discovered, which had some problems with it, some of the elements didn't quite match up where they were supposed to, and like the masses were a little bit backwards sometimes. It turns out if you do it by atomic number instead of by mass, the pattern is absolute. It is perfect. And so that's how our modern periodic table is arranged. You'll notice that I've got it in red. That's because every once in a while, there is a Regents exam question where it says, like, how is the modern periodic table arranged? And you need to know 
The modern periodic table is arranged by, by atomic number, by the number of protons. And so if you look at your periodic table, go ahead, get out your periodic table. If you look at your periodic table, you'll notice that the atomic numbers go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and they don't skip any. Our periodic table from 1 to 118 goes in order perfectly. But if you look at the atomic masses of some of those, you'll notice that for some of them, the atomic masses don't go in perfect order. So, you know, one example of that would be like um, potassium and argon. Find argon on the right-hand side. Find potassium on the left-hand side. Shouldn't potassium have a bigger mass than, than argon? It doesn't. So Mendeleev's idea was incomplete because he didn't know about protons. But once we learned about protons, we figured out that actually elements follow this pattern of eights based on their atomic number. All right, some terminology that we need to know and love, which means memorize, right? And here's where you can pull out your blank periodic tables and color them in as I go. This is also going to be lightning fast, so please do pause the video in order to keep up, okay? because I'm just here talking. So first thing we need to know is that the periodic table is arranged in columns. Those columns are called groups or families. Now, I always say groups because that was what I was taught when I was in high school, but sometimes you'll hear people refer to families on the periodic table. That just means the vertical columns, okay? So groups. Now, there are four of them that we need to know. Oh, and before I go on, the columns, there's 18 of them now, not eight. But the columns are what we have, uh, you know, are, are what determines the properties of an element. So if you look at like carbon and silicon and germanium, those will actually have very similar properties. Those will have very similar properties. If you look at fluorine and chlorine and bromine and iodine, those elements will have similar properties. So we still arrange the periodic table in columns of elements that have similar properties. Those are called groups. All right, here's the four that you need to know the names of. And by know the names of, I mean memorize these names. Okay. Group one over here on the left are called the alkali metals. Alkali metals. Now, I'll bet you didn't know that like lithium and sodium, which you might have heard of, or potassium, which you might have heard of, those are actually metals. In fact, these are the most reactive elements on the periodic table. These elements get explosive when they, get, when they touch water, they react with air, and they react with another group of elements that I'm about to tell you about. They are hugely reactive. The group one alkali metals are some of the most reactive elements on the periodic table. In fact, we're going to learn a trend where as you go down the group from hydrogen all the way down to francium, they actually get more and more uh, reactive, which is pretty cool. Now, the next one is the second one, although these are not the ones that I said I was going to show you for you know, which these guys react with, but the second group is called the alkaline earth metals. I find that to be very frustrating because it sounds the same, doesn't it? Alkali metals versus alkaline earth metals. You just gotta know it. Alkaline earth metals. By the way, alkaline, that's where the word like alkaline battery comes from, right? They have these elements in there from group two. So we're talking about like magnesium and calcium. Calcium is in your bones. It's a metal. Did you know? Amazing, right? Now, these elements are still pretty reactive, but much less reactive than group one. So group two, alkaline earth metals. Now we're going to skip over all that stuff in the middle. And we're going to come right over here to halogens. Halogens, group 17. Halogens, halo means salt. Gens means like maker, so generate you know, like like a generator or or um, 
generator, I guess, is the only thing I can think of. Halogens means salt makers. The halogens are also explosively reactive, hugely reactive elements in this group. Guess who they react with? They react with the alkali metals. So the alkali metals like to react with the halogens. And if you'll notice, the halogens, or I'm sorry, the alkali metals have sodium, right? Sodium, Na. And the halogens have chlorine, Cl. What do we call sodium chloride? I'll give you a hint. It's delicious on French fries. So, so halogens mean salt makers because they react with the alkali metals to form salts. And when they do, they get a little splody. It's very exciting. So that's group 17. And finally, the last one that you need to know and love is group 18. The noble gases don't react almost at all. They are so unreactive that they're like nobles who are far above all of the riffraff. The noble gases are elements that are completely inert. Now that might seem really strange, right? Because I just told you that the halogens are very reactive and the alkali metals are very reactive. And then all of a sudden you've got group 18 way over there on the right that's not reactive at all. I'm not going to show you this on the video because it kind of just doesn't do it justice. But when I come back to class, I'm going to show you the periodic table is actually shaped like a circle. We could connect group 18 back around again to group 1 and make a circular periodic table. And if you look at it that way, you have this unreactive group directly in between the group one, which is hugely reactive, and group 17, which is hugely reactive. So it kind of has like a cool symmetry to it. At any rate, those are the four groups that you need to know and love. Now, moving on to rows. The rows of the periodic table are going to be the subject of the next PowerPoint. But we need to know that they're called periods, and there are seven of them. So there are 18 groups, right? If we look back here, there's 18 groups that go across. There's seven periods that go down. Luckily, there's no names that you have to memorize for these. We just need to know which period we're talking about. Okay, so they're numbered over here on the left-hand side. All right. I mentioned this once before in class, but I wanted to take a moment now and say it again. Remember how that F block, those elements that are sort of detached from the periodic table and we write them down underneath, right? Those elements in what we call the F block, those actually belong inside the periodic table, but we don't usually want to write a periodic or make it print a periodic table that's longer than the sheet of paper that we're trying to use. So the F block usually gets detached and put underneath. But the real shape of the periodic table looks like this. And it curves around to make a circle. I'll show you in class. I've got a, I've got a, uh, I've got a model of it in class. Now, what's with all these blocks? That's the last thing for this PowerPoint. So the periodic table can be broken down into four perfect rectangles. Now, if you take a minute and you look for those perfect rectangles, you're like, wait a minute, they're not perfect. What about this piece that's missing right here, this group two? Like, shouldn't there be something there if that's going to be a rectangle? And also, what's with helium over here? That's kind of like bumped on top of the other rectangle there, right? Well, it turns out helium actually belongs over here. If you're talking about how the electrons are, are sort of situated and configured inside of the electron cloud, helium belongs to group 2. So why on earth do we put it in group 18? Remember, the most important thing that we get from the periodic table by lining it up this way is we have columns of atoms that have the same property. So helium's uh, a very, very inert gas. It doesn't react with anything at all. And the other noble gases are similar. So most periodic tables that you see, at least at the high school level, have helium 
over here in group 18 because that's where it has similar properties. But there are some periodic tables out there that put helium over here on the, on the left in group 2 because those periodic tables tell you about the electron configurations. And so it depends on what kind of a chemist you are. What are you studying? If you're studying electrons, you probably have a periodic table that looks a little different with helium over here. So our periodic table puts it in group 18 because the columns tell us elements that have similar properties. I'm going to say that for like a fifth time because it's super important. The columns, the vertical groups, are groups of atoms that have similar properties. I wonder if that will come up on a test. All right. So... The first one over there on the left, that rectangle that includes helium, that is called the S block. I don't know why. I have two degrees in chemistry, and I couldn't tell you why we call it the S block. I think it might have to do with, like, back when we were discovering things about, like, the electron cloud. Those elements have electron clouds that are kind of spherical. So S for sphere, maybe. I don't know. Those are the S block. On the right hand side, this kind of square shaped block, this square shaped uh, rectangle over here, it's almost a rectangle, uh, or it's almost a square. Um, these are called the P block. Again, no freaking clue. P for something in German, maybe? I don't know. Anyway, together, the S and the P block are called the representative elements. The reason for that is because they have patterns that we can actually like talk about and we will talk about them later in the week those patterns uh behave themselves beautifully for the s and the p block you can predict a lot of different cool patterns for the s and p block the other elements the d block they don't follow the patterns quite as nicely as the as the representative elements now the d block in the middle from group thir three over to 12 those are really cool you got a lot of great elements in there. Copper, silver, gold, platinum, iron. You know, I'm, I'm partial to manganese. I like that element real well. Mercury's in there. These are cool elements that are really, really important. They just don't follow the patterns that the S block and the P block follow. So they get called the D block, and they're not considered representative elements. They're called transition metals. And then finally, this group down here that's kind of, or this, I'm sorry, they're not a group. This, this couple of rows, this block that's down here that's detached from the periodic table that really belongs up there in sort of in between, that's called the F block, and it's the inner transition metals. I'm not sure where they got that name from, but the inner transition metals are kind of interesting. They are all very, very, very similar to each other. These are elements that are radioactive, and uh, they have things like uranium in them. Americium is in your smoke detector. Um, so these are really cool elements, but um, they are different. And so they kind of get detached and put underneath. So that's what it looks like, right? This picture that I've got here calls the representative elements. They call them the main group. It's kind of an antiquated term. We're going to call them the, the representative elements. And then the transition metals and the inner transition metals, those two are cool, but they don't, um, they don't follow the patterns quite as well. So here's your summary. Groups and families, those are the vertical columns. And there are four columns that we need to know the names of. Alkali metals, alkaline earth metals, halogens, and noble gases. The periods are the rows. There are seven of them. Someday there will be more. When we discover new elements, they'll have to go on the next row down. And then there's four blocks. S, P, D, and F. No idea why they've got those letters, but that's what they are. All right, so uh, we need to know that S and P, like salt and pepper, those are the representative elements. And then the transition and inner transition metals, those are the D and F block. And that's it. Thanks for watching my PowerPoint. Um, I am... Uh, you know, delighted that you watched. <laughs>